Remember when people used to ask you what you wanted to be when you grew up? And do you remember all those possibilities that lay before you? Maybe they were about how you were going to become an astronaut or a princess. Or maybe you wanted to be a ninja turtle or a professional athlete. Whatever it was for you, these possibilities were the process of you trying to figure out who you would eventually become. Essentially, they were the first seeds of consideration sown in your heart about answering the question, what could be out there for me? Now, let's be honest. Most of us won't become astronauts or princesses, and even fewer of us will become ninja turtles. But that doesn't matter. What does matter, though, is the reality that we will become something. And what matters even more than that is answering the question of what that something will be. Remember when you were a kid and it seemed like life would only begin after you became a grown-up? Because once that happened, the possibilities were endless. You could stay up as late as you wanted. You could eat candy for dinner or even keep that dog you just found. Well, guess what? That moment of your life beginning, it's here. It's happening. You are graduating. You're closing a chapter while also opening a brand new one. And as you write the rest of your story, here's a few things to remember. Work hard, not just at your job, but in life. Listen more than you talk and make relationships that last a lifetime. Find the right person to marry. And remember, you have to be the right person for them too. Take risks. Travel. Remember the compliments you receive and forget the insults. And definitely, don't forget to laugh. Also, stay in touch with your parents. Your mom worries about you. Jesus once said, I have come to give you life and life to the fullest. And that's what you have the chance to achieve. Life. A full life. So go on and live it. Well, congratulations to our graduates. Uh, we welcome you guys here. If you're joining us online, we are so glad that you're here with us. And if you are on our website or our app, we encourage you to go ahead and interact with some of our MC3ers that are standing by. If you have any questions, uh, comments, or even snide remarks you'd like to make, feel free to just go ahead and type it out to them, and they'll type back out to you. Uh, if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, uh, then if you would like to interact with us, you can email us at info at mc3.life. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to get back with you. We also want to welcome those in our parking lot. There we go. All right. Never gets old. And for those of you in, in here in person, we're glad that you're here with us today. Hey, listen, uh, I know we, we're going to honor our graduates and we're going to have a great time with that. But also just want to thank Will Tyler for all of his hard work with our students uh, and did an incredible job. In fact, all the logistics today, for the most part, uh, Will has uh, led the charge in all the logistics outside. So he's going to be busy doing some things out there. Uh, and so he made he he. Uh, said, hey, I want chicken, you know, God's uh, meat. And we said, okay, that's great. And so he had everything else going on. We just kind of let him go for it. And so he does an incredible job. Make sure you stop off and thank him and Ray for all the great things that they do for our children and our youth. Hey, listen, I don't know about you. Uh, maybe you guys have seen this before. Uh, maybe you've seen the Salt Life stickers. Have you ever seen those on the back of a car? You ever seen a Salt Life shirt? Okay, so there you go. Uh, you, got, you see the logo right here. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but basically... This Salt Life brand is really meant to convey a passion for kind of everything ocean, everything salt air, everything that's kind of like beach, right? Uh, and so it's kind of centered around that sort of atmosphere. But some of you may not be uh, quite beach people. So some of you may be what I'm going to call mountain men or mountain women, where you would rather enjoy going to a cabin somewhere, either North Carolina uh, or in Tennessee. Maybe you prefer Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge type area in order to go to, that you just enjoy the hiking and the picnicking and kind of being out in nature up in a higher elevation. So if you are kind of more of a mountain 
man or mountain woman, uh, would you raise, just raise your hand, let us know if that's you. Okay, you just kind of prefer that more than anything else. Okay, uh, apparently Chip is a mountain person, apparently outside. Um, maybe, but maybe for some of you, you're not a mountain person, but you're what I will call maybe a city slicker. Uh, you enjoy going to some of the big cities. You enjoy the shows. You would rather go shopping. Uh, you would rather maybe go to a Broadway play, uh, take in the sights and the sounds of a city. Maybe you would not like to go off in the mountains where you're up by yourself because you're afraid you'll hear banjo music, but you're okay. You're okay with going to the city where you hear horns and things like that. So if you're more of a city slicker, if that's the kind of thing that really kind of gets you going, raise your hand. All right, okay. <laughs> Jackie's like, that's me right there. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so, but if you're more, this is, what, this is me right here. If you're more of a beach bum, if you're more of a beach bum where you just, you just love the salt air, you love the ocean, uh, you love uh, being out on, uh, out on the beach, you just kind of love all the seafood, and you just love, you would, you would just rather spend all day. out. Of, if, if you're more of a beach person, would you raise your hand? All right. Now, how many of you are a, kind of a hybrid? Kind of, I want, I'm all the, all the above, right? So some of, some of you may be, right? Well, for me, I'm more, I've got to be honest with you, I'm more of a beach guy. I'm a beach, I'm a beach bum. I, 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 would, I would much rather get up in the morning, go out on the beach, and, and watch, just watch the ocean, hear the ocean, smell the salt air. I would much rather go out with my boogie board and get wiped out by a big wave where you know, it kind of tumbles you a little bit and get up and go, man, that was awesome. Uh, I, would rather, I would rather have a good book and uh, a couple of, of beach chairs, Christy by my side, and just soaking in all the sun. I, in fact, I don't even mind. I don't even mind the suntan lotion and, and the, the greasiness afterwards. I kind of like that. It's kinda, I just kind of love being at the beach. That's just me. I love the salt life. In fact, when I think of salt life, to me, that's a dream. Man, I would love uh, just to open my door up and to be right there at the beach. Well, over the next few weeks, we're going to be in a sermon series, and we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And today, what we're going to find out is Jesus, right out the gate, talks about how important it is for us to have the salt life. And for our graduates today, for those that are watching online this is, this is what we all need to do as believers in Christ. We need to have this salt life. Uh, in fact, uh, Jesus reminds us that we are to live in, in such a way that we are to be the salt and light of the world. We're to be the flavor uh, in this tasteless, uh, uh, immoral world that we find ourselves living in. And we are to be the light in this dark world that we seem to be finding. In many ways, if you watch the news, especially if you watch it way too much, it gets darker and darker and darker. In fact, yesterday I'm sitting outside this tire store and this lady comes up and she goes, and she just said, I just don't like social media anymore. I'm just done with it. And I said, I just kind of looked at her as if we'd known each other all, all along. And, and she just says, I'm just, I don't watch the news anymore. And so we kind of talked about that the more and more you watch the news and the more and more you consume it and it's all a part of you, it can kind of depress you if you're not careful. And so it kind of reminds us that as believers in Christ, we are to make sure that we are the salt in this strange world we find ourselves in. In fact, Jesus even says that we are to live the salt life by saying in John 14, verse 15, he says it this way, If you love me, keep my commands. If you love me, keep my commands. You see, the way God defines how we love him is in our actions. Not, in our, not in, in our thoughts and go, hey, I love God, I, I, love, I love who he is. or uh, Not in our, uh, the, verbally, the way that we, you know, just a little bit ago, as you sang, you were singing your love for God. He loves all those things, those are great. But what he really enjoys, what he really wants from us, is that we would obey what he says. And so what, how we really show love for God is that we do what he says, that we live this salt life in which he has called us to live. Now we're calling this series... Lost teachings, and it's kind of got a double meaning, and maybe I've shared this with you before. If not, then you'll uh, catch on here, but it's got a double meaning because in this world, it seems as if there are some teachings that, are going, that go against God's word that we seem to hear, and even as Christians, even, even receive and even slightly kind of step into just a little bit. They are, they are quite literally teachings of lost people. Uh, the lost people in this world. And so uh, while uh, we, we look at this and we think, we hear some things, and it can be confusing what we hear because we hear one thing or we hear one thing in, a, in, our, in the movies or, or wherever it might be because some of these 
lost teachings, these teachings from lost people, come to us through social media. They come to us through uh, uh, TV shows that we hear, usually followed by a laugh track that's behind uh, the, 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 the uh, video itself or the, the movie that we're watching. We hear it in our movies uh, through, you know, as we're, as we're, as we're eating in uh, buttery popcorn. Uh, and remember, we, we could do that, right? And, and eating uh, junior mints. You know, we kind of hear it in that setting. We kind of hear it sometimes uh, as, uh, as uh, on college campuses. Our graduates that are going off to college are going to, they're going to be sitting around people that are going to teach their lost teachings to our kids uh, and they're going to be professed as wise and yet the things that they say some of them may even go against what we read in God's word even happens in our schools uh, local schools and so we see that in our world there are all these teachings that go counter to what we read uh, in the scripture and it sometimes it's hard for us to spot it's hard for us to be able to pick out the weeds from uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, weeds from, from the plants that are there, you know, the tares that kind of grow together. It's hard for us sometimes to spot that. But the, the second reason we want to call this the lost teachings is that in some ways it seems in our society today that the teachings of Jesus seem to be lost to our world. And they're lost, I think, for a couple of reasons. I think one of the main, main reasons is because we as believers in Christ maybe aren't living the salt life like we're called to, but yet the, there's lost, the people are kind of lost to the teachings of Jesus. They may have heard about Jesus. Uh, they may, some may not. I mean, there's some people that live in our neighborhood, in our community that have never heard of Jesus. I never forget when Christy went to get her toes done and she was talking about Easter and how uh, they were, you know, she was going to go to church and, and, and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. The lady was like, who's Jesus? She had not heard about Jesus before. And that's interesting to think about. You think, how in the world can that happen? But it, but it does. And so we want to make sure that we dive into God's word and look at his truths that he gives to us so that, that we might know the correct teachings of Jesus. And many of these teachings, many of these teachings taught, are taught, taught by Jesus himself. They are true, but they are hard words sometimes to take in. Now listen, many of you in, in, in the audience have been around church for a long time. You've heard multiple sermons on the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon. And sometimes the familiarity with, the, with this text doesn't really, uh, it causes us to really not think about the, the hard teaching that Jesus is giving to the people. Because what he's about to deliver is quite frankly, it's very tough. It's tough to take in. It was tough to take in in this day and age, and it's going to be tough to take in even in our day and age. I just had a conversation with someone this week, for an example. Uh, they, they, were, they were talking about how uh, this, this past week uh, they were um, in, invited to be a part of a, a wedding ceremony uh, and, uh, between uh, uh, two uh, lesbian women. Uh, and so all they, um, all, they had to, all they had to do, though, as a family, is just watch online. Uh, watch this service online. But they were, there was this conflict, this tension that was going on between them. What do we do in this case? What do we do here? You see, there's no easy answers for our world today. Uh, it's, it, it just underscores uh, the importance of digging into God's Word and trying to figure out what is God telling us to do as believers in Christ? What is the truth and what, is the, what are the things that God wants us to do? And so here's the thing. These messages that Jesus gives us are tough. They're hard. They were hard back in, this, back in Jesus' day, and they're going to be hard for us in our day and age. And so for those of us who read the Sermon on the Mount, and we kind of go, okay, I get it, I'm going to ask you not to just go, okay, I understand this, I've heard this before, and kind of push it to the side. Really kind of lean in and dig into what Jesus is saying, especially in light of the world that we find ourselves in. So here's what I'm going to try to do throughout this sermon series, because we're going to do this in May uh, and through June. I'm going to do my level best to approach these sermons with sensitivity uh, and with love and grace uh, without, without compromising the truth that's in God's word. I'm going to try to do that to the best of my ability. Uh, I want you to know uh, it is not my intent at, at all to make anyone angry uh, or to ostracize anyone uh, or make anyone feel less than. That's not, that's not the intent of all of this. I simply want to share with you uh, in the most loving and graceful way I can the truth of what we see in God's word and what Jesus 
was trying to teach us in the Sermon on the Mount. As Ephesians 4, and that Paul says, he says, speak the truth in love. That's what we hope to do here at MC3. And so, for those of you who may hear this message and, uh, and also, the other side of it, be tempted to kind of point your finger at people and go, ha ha, that's right, you know, yeah, you shouldn't be doing X, Y, and Z. Listen to what Jesus is saying here. I want to remind all of us, as believers in Christ, now you may not know this, but all of us in here have broken every ten commandment. Some of it we've done in we've done it with our actions, and others we've done within our hearts. And that's what we're going to see when we look at what Jesus has to say through this sermon series. As James chapter 2, verse 10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Because here's the thing. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount, what we see is that all of us are in need of a Savior. Every single one of us. So none of us can stand from a position of, uh, of, of moral high ground and point at someone else that you do this and you're doing this and you're doing this and this is what's going to happen to you if you continue to, from just pointing and judging from that position of moral high ground. You see, Paul even says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And the Greek word all is all of us, right? So yeah, so it's everyone. All of us have done all of that. And yet, while none of us can point a judgmental finger at other people, what Jesus is telling us in the salt life is that we don't point our finger at people, but we point people to Jesus. See, that's what we're called to do. When we live the salt life, we're called to point people to Jesus. Not point at people, but to point people to a Savior who can save us. We all have a need for a Savior. Everybody that we rub elbows with have a need for a Savior. And so, therefore, we need to point uh, our way, their way, all, everybody's way to Jesus who can save them, who alone can save them. And so, this is a salt life that Jesus is calling to. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. Right at the gate, verse 13, he says, You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Now, who's he talking about, about here? Is he talking about the religious leaders, the Pharisees, uh, some of the teachers of the law? No, he's not talking about them. Is he talking about just some of the crowd that just kind of stumbled in and went, what's everybody doing here, you know, and kind of just walking up and kind of listening to what Jesus has to say? He's not really even talking to the crowd here. Jesus is actually speaking to his disciples, the people that are following him. Everybody else that's hearing this, it's just kind of a bonus. Jesus is actually speaking to his disciples. So, if you are a disciple of Christ, he's talking to you. If you are a follower of Jesus, he's talking to you. If you are a graduate who loves Jesus and desires to follow him as best you know how, then he's speaking to you. If you're a mom and a dad uh, that you're raising your kids up and, and you're following Jesus, he's speaking to you. If you're retired and you, those days are kind of behind you now and you've got grandkids that are graduating, but you follow Jesus, he's speaking to you. He's speaking to all those who are followers of Christ. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. MC3 Church, you are, we are, the salt of the earth. I like how one commentary says that he says, in, ancient, in the ancient world, salt was very valuable. The Greeks thought it contained something almost divine. And the Romans sometimes paid their soldiers in salt. Think about that. That's how valuable it was. And if a soldier was not doing his due diligence and doing his duty, he wasn't worth his salt. And so here, Jesus looks at his disciples, looks at the people that are following him, not the other people, not the crowd around, and he says, you are the salt of the earth. You're valuable. You are valuable. You are the salt of the earth. You have a job. You have an assignment. And our assignment as people who live the salt life is to point people to Jesus. That's what we are called to do. We are called to point people to Jesus. And you may be thinking, well, hang on. I just want to go to college. I just want to go to college. I want to study hard. I want to get my degree. I want to have some fun along the way. And I get it. I get it. But you've been called to something more than that. You've been called to live the salt life. Some of you may be going, well, hey, listen, I just, I just want to go to my job, work my 8 to 10 hours or whatever it is you have to work, and then come on home and, and you know, just do my thing. And I get it. 
But you've been called to the salt life if you're a believer in Christ. You've been called to a higher assignment than just working those 8 to 10 hours and just coming home. Some of you may be thinking, Lord, I'm, I'm retired. You know, I'm, I'm ready to travel and I'm ready to, to do what I, kind of what I want. You know, I, I want to you know, crochet or I want to, uh, you know, got a few hobbies I want to I wanna, I do. I want to play golf, plant flowers, you know, relax. And I get it. I get it. It sounds great. But if, you, if, you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you've been called to follow the salt life. And so you have a higher assignment that God has given to you. He desires that all of us point people to Jesus. You see, that's our primary assignment. Our primary directive is to point people to Jesus as followers of Christ. That's what he's telling his disciples as Jesus is up on, up on that mountain giving this sermon. And that's what he's telling us as we read Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7. We are to point people to him. We are the salt of the earth. You, you are the salt of the earth. And if we don't do it, if we don't do it, who will? Who will? Then he says, But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer, it's no good, no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You see, the salt has to be effective in order to work. It has to retain that which makes it salty. And so, when salt makes contact with the meat, uh, with, the, with the beef, or with the lamb, or with the fish, it, it still has to make contact to do what it's supposed to do, but it also needs to stay salty. You see, as believers in Christ, we do not have the luxury of retreating to some compound somewhere where we all just get together and we huddle in the castle and we sing kumbaya and we just hope that the world just kind of does its thing while we do ours. We don't have that kind of luxury. If we're going to be living the salt life, then we have to actually rub elbows with our neighbors and our friends and family. We can't just go, well, you guys do your thing and if you guys want to go to hell in a handbasket, you guys go ahead, but I'm going to make sure that I got mine. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, as followers of Christ, we are called, we are meant to, we are given an assignment to tell people about Jesus, to point the way to where they might be saved, because all of us are in need of a Savior. Sometimes I think that we've stayed in the salt shaker maybe just a little too long. Maybe just a little too long. And then Jesus says this. He says, you're the light of the world. Different analogy. It says, a town on a hill uh, cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So what he's saying here is as followers of Christ, we can make a real difference. A real difference to a lost and dying world. And really to kind of center it down even more. We can make a real difference in the heart and life of one person that doesn't know Jesus or even refuses to know Jesus. We have that opportunity if we will just live the salt life. But see, we have to maintain our saltiness. We have to maintain our saltiness. We have to continue to shine our light, meaning that if we lean into sin, if we trade the salt life, in for uh, an, uh, an immoral, uh, flavorless life, if we choose to live a lukewarm life, then we lose the opportunity many times to make a difference. We lose that opportunity to make a difference. We lose the opportunity to reach the one who's lost right there with us. And so there's this balance that takes place. There's this balance that takes place between the fact that I'm in the world, it's, it's around us, and yet I'm not of the world. I'm salty. There's something about me that's different, not because of me, not because of my righteousness, but because of Christ, because of what he's done. He's made me salty, and so therefore I have the opportunity now to rub off onto those around me and help to point the way to Jesus. You see, this is why, as we've said multiple times here, here at Mount Carmel, this is why we strive to sin less and less. Because we understand the dangers of sin. We understand the destruction of what sin can do to us. And we understand grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And we want to make sure that we are delivering 
to them, that grace and mercy so they can know Jesus and they will want to be salty too. And so Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, I want you to listen to what he says here. He says he's going to call us to a higher standard as followers of Christ. You see, we're, we're called to a higher standard. See, there's teachings of the lost that we're hearing and we're even taking in. And, even, and not just, not just uh, um, us uh, out into the world and people around us, but I'm talking actually people in the church are receiving these teachings that go counter to God's word. We're receiving those in if, if, as if that could happen to us. We're receiving some of these teachings in. So he's going to call us to a higher standard. So Jesus says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter. Now think about this. This is talking about the Old Testament. A lot of times we like to lean into the New Testament because it seems a little softer, right? It seems a little less prickly. But he's only talking about the Old Testament because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. Jesus was in the process of writing that, right, as he's living it out. Jesus says, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, and everybody else within earshot, but specifically his disciples, that living the salt life is not easy. Graduates, it's not easy. College campus, it's not easy. Out in the workforce, it's not easy. It's not easy to live the salt life. You see, Jesus didn't just, when he, when he died for us, he didn't just remove the bar so now we could do whatever we want. We got freedom to you know, kind of live it up because uh, there's grace out there. And all I have to do is ask for forgiveness. I can do whatever I want, live however I want, live like the world. It's not what Jesus did. He didn't just remove the bar. He actually raised the bar. And we look at that and go, how am I going to get over that? How am I going to live like that? Because you see, the moral law of the Old Testament is still in effect. Now, there's a civic law in the Old Testament that doesn't apply to us because that only applied to Israel, you know. Uh, things like, uh, you know, how you deal with uh, uh, your neighbor's donkey and that sort of thing, right? Uh, so there's some, there's some civic law in there. And then there's also some religious law that you and I can't do because Jesus has already fulfilled that. So we, if, like if, if tomorrow there's a temple built in Israel, you know, we're not going to go and take a, you know, go buy a lamb and go sacrifice a lamb in that temple. That would be an abomination to what Jesus has done for us at the cross. See, we can't do that even if we wanted to. But the moral law that we find in the Old Testament is still in place. And Jesus says, I'm not taking that away. Not the least stroke of a pen is going to be removed from that. We're, we're all going to follow that. And so this bar is still set really, really high. In fact, what we're going to find as Jesus goes on, he's going to keep raising the bar and raising the bar and raising the bar and raising the bar. And then in verse 19, he says this, Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly. That's, this is where we have to lean in. Listen to this. And teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Mom and dad, brother, sister, grandma, grandpa, all of us, be careful what you teach. Whether it's verbally out of your mouth, or by your actions, or by your posts, uh, or by just by what we agree to in this world. Be very careful what we teach others, because inadvertently we might lead others into sin. We might lead others into sin. You see, the salt life is not easy. This is not an easy life. I love what, Patrick, I'm going to throw you under the bus just a little bit. I love what Patrick said to Jim Barber. Jim Barber is praying for Patrick. He says, how can I pray for you? This tells me the level of, of uh, maturity of some of our seniors. I would never have said this. I, I, would have been, I was too immature at the time. Patrick, Patrick said, he didn't say, oh, well, pray that, you know, I get a car for graduation or pray that I, you know, uh, w you know whatever. He didn't pray for those things. He said, he said, pray that I make the right choices. Man, that is powerful. It's exactly the prayer that all of us should be praying, right? Lord, help me to make the right choices, to live the salt life the way you've called me to live it. Because it's not easy. Patrick recognizes that. It's not easy. It's not easy to live in the salt life. And then Jesus says, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You see, the salt life, while not easy, man, it sure is rewarding. 
sure is rewarding. And then Jesus says in verse 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. For the people in that day, for those disciples, they were like, what? Because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they kept the, the, the law to the letter. I mean, I'm talking down to the grain of salt that they were supposed to give and all the little things. They tried to keep it just as best as they could. And still they couldn't clear the bar that Jesus has set for all of us in the salt life. So can I ask the question, well, how do, how do, I, how do, I, how do I do that then? How do I clear the bar that Jesus has given to us? How do I, how do I get into heaven? How do I do that? Because the bar seems way too high, and it is. It is way too high for your righteousness or my righteousness to hurdle that. There is no way that can take place. And so we look at that and go, well, what do I do? Well, first of all, take it easy. Take a step back. Take a breath. Because the truth is that your righteousness and my righteousness and nobody else's righteousness around us was ever able to do that. Ever able to do that. And that's why we have a need for a Savior. And that's why we point people to Jesus. That's why we do that. All we have to do, all we have to do is just put our faith in Him. So, why even live the salt life? Quite frankly, why even live it? Why worry about it? If Jesus has already cleared the bar, if, we, if He's already done all the heavy lifting, why are we worried about this? Let's just do what we want, Right? As Paul says, uh, you know, uh, should I just go on sinning so that grace may abound? He says, by no means. What do I do with this? If God's already cleared the bar, why am I stressing about living the way that Christ is calling me to live? Because this is the life that Jesus, the King, has called all of us to live. He's asked us to sign up for that salt life that's not easy. And if we sign up for the salt life, if we sign up to live that way, uh, then, then he's going to walk with us. Because when we live the salt life, here's the thing that's really incredible. When we live the salt life, and we're loving one another, and we're caring for one another, and we're honestly trying to help one another out, we reveal to those around us a need for a Savior. We point people to Jesus, and we can make a difference in the life of people that don't know him. See, what would it look like if we tr- what would it look like in our own lives if we just truly live the salt life that Christ calls us to live? How would that look for us just, just personally? Man, how incredible would that be? But, th- but, but think about it this way. What would happen if we lived that life and other people saw that and other people were pointed to Jesus? What would that look like? What difference could we make in the lives of others if we truly strive to live the salt life that we're called to live? And so over the next few weeks, this is where we're going to camp out. Uh, This is what we're going to unpack as we look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and 7. And so here in just a second, we're going to take opportunity to take communion. Uh, You should have had it on your chairs, I believe. And when the music plays, you can partake at at your leisure. If you're online, now's a good time. If you go, oh, no, I got surprised by communion, and you want to rush out into the kitchen and grab your cracker or your juice, now's the time to do that. But here's the thing. When When we look at communion, it reminds us of the salt life that we're called to live. How Jesus died for us on the cross, took our sins upon himself in on his body, He bore those things, sweat drops of blood for you and for me, nailed those sins to the cross. And that juice reminds us of his blood that washes away our sins. See, Jesus cleared that hurdle for us. And when we live that salt life, all we have to do is point others to him. And so in this time, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you that if you have never made Jesus your Lord and Savior, if you're watching online and you've never made Jesus your Lord and Savior, and you can chat with one of our MC3ers right now. You can ask, hey, how, how do I do that? Well, what's my first step? How do I make Jesus Lord of my life? Or, or if you want to, uh, you can also do this, if you're, especially if you're watching on YouTube and Facebook. You can actually text this number, 833-459-0607. Just text the word yes, as if, yes, I need Jesus, or yes, I need a relationship with him, or yes, I need to be saved. Just type the word yes 
and we will get back with you. We'll, we'll reach out to you and, and get in touch with you. Or if you've got questions, if you've got questions, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa this, is, I'm, this is a lot I'm taking in. I'm drinking from the fire hose here. I've got to, I need to take a step back and just ask a few questions. If you've got questions, just text the word questions, uh, or you can text your actual question into us, and we will do our best to try to help you find that answer uh, in the scriptures as to what it says about that question that you may have. Now, if you're in person, I'll be right down front. If you uh, need to know Jesus today, if you're not sure about where you stand with him, I'll be right down here. And if you need prayer, I'll be happy to pray with you today. Let me pray with you right now. Father God, we thank you for your grace and mercy that you freely give to us. Freely you give to us. Anyone. Lord, there is, there, there is no sin. You know it. There is no sin too great that you didn't die for already. The enemy, enemy would like to tell all of us that our sin's too big. There's too many of them. God can never, never die for that many sins or that, that particular sin. But Lord, we know that's not true. You died for all the sins that we would commit. Every one of them. And so, Father, we know all we have to do is put our faith and trust in you. And, Father, for those of us that are followers of yours, for those of us that are disciples, for those of us that are striving the best, as best as we know how to live the salt life. Lord, we're never perfect at it. You know that. None of us are ever perfect in the salt life. But as we strive, Lord God, to live that life, we recognize that you have died for our sins, our sins. You took those to the cross. And so, Father, we thank you. And that gives us the opportunity to partake of communion today. That as we examine ourselves and we see that we are not righteous in and of ourselves, but we recognize that you are righteous, way more righteous to die for all of our sins. And that's what gives us the opportunity to be able to step into your presence today. And Father, we thank you for that. And Lord, I thank you for our graduates. Lord, I, I, maybe for some reason this particular class, maybe because my son's a part of it, but for whatever reason, these students are particularly, I don't know, I'm kind of fond of them more than any others in some ways. Father, I just ask that you would bless them in their next endeavor the next steps, Lord God, that you're going to carry them to. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would raise up this generation to live such a salt life that would impact and even begin a revival that needs, that needs to spread from coast to coast in this country and, may, and really in, around the world. And so, Father God, I pray that you would use our graduates that they might impact this world and set it on fire for you, Lord God, that they might know you. Thank you for that. Lord, bless us now as we partake of these emblems. I pray that you would just walk with us this week as we strive to live that salt life. It's in Jesus' name that I pray these things.